On the phone, we have Congressman Mo Brooks joining us. Uh, Congressman, how are you today? Uh, doing fine. I'm in the middle of a six-mile walk. That's further than I've walked in a long time, Congressman. That, that's uh, that. It, it's all keeping yourself healthy, right? Well, trying to, trying to get some exercise in uh, from uh, my condo to the Capitol to the Lincoln Memorial and back. Now, the real question is, do you have your mask on, Congressman? Uh, no, I'm outside, and just by way of background for people who are concerned about that, the half-life for COVID-19 in a nice, cool, air-conditioned building is about 18 hours. But out in the humidity, the heat, and the sun, it's two minutes. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, and that 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 is I, I I've had a hard time dealing with the you know the concept. I mean, that, there's very few viruses that that do well in heat, right? And so we all hope that would be the case, but it seems that science has kind of fallen by the wayside in a lot of this, and it's become mostly agenda driven. And so what what I wanted to talk with you about today was specifically in Alabama with. Governor Ivey considering the extending the safer at home order and 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 the the cities that are are mandating masks. I just kind of wanted to get your take on on the COVID situation and and is it still is it science or is it agenda? Well, it's a little bit of both. Uh, certainly, COVID nineteen has risk associated with it. If I go into a store, by way of example, I will almost always wear my mask. Uh, when I'm on the House floor, unless I'm speaking, I will almost always wear my mask. But when I'm outdoors, where the risk is extraordinarily low, uh, I go for fresh air as opposed to rebreathing my own air, which is what you often do when you're wearing a mask. It's certainly uncomfortable, um, and the convenience factor is something that I think a lot of people push back on. But, but if I'm hearing you correctly, that, that you, you're you're equally weighing the risk that the real risk that are that are representative of of the disease or the the virus rather uh, certainly, but but also a common sense approach in in regards to to where and how the virus would spread. That that being said, the reason I ask you about Wait, can it, can I interject for just a yeah, moment? Yeah, absolutely. Let me emphasize what's going on with COVID-19 because the public is driven to a panic by the fake news media and the Socialist Democrats. Okay, we're not in a good situation, but we have to make the best of the situation we're in. We have two options here. We can huddle up in our homes, which to some degree minimizes the risk of COVID-19, but for a certainty, it collapses our economy, which in turn, a collapsed economy would cost far more American lives than the COVID-19 ever would. And so we're, we're in a situation where there are three potential forecasts going forward. One is we get a vaccine. That'd be great. But we haven't had success getting a vaccine. We may never have success getting a vaccine. I hope that we do. That's one outcome. Second outcome is we find a cure. You know, we're making progress. Certainly the death rate from COVID-19 is declining. Uh, I'm talking about per capita. And that's good because our healthcare profession is getting better at treating uh, COVID-19. There's also the chance that it has uh, weakened over time as a virus. And the third outcome is we don't have a cure. We don't have a vaccine. We're just going to have to let this thing run through society. Those of us uh, who are healthy will be more likely to survive. Those of us who are elderly and have immunity issues will be less likely to survive. But we have no choice. Those are only three options. None of them are ideal or great. But we have to recognize the facts of the circumstances that we're in and adjust ourselves accordingly. And that's what I try to do. No, there's a there's a level of common sense that that we have to operate with that that seems to elude a lot of people in in today and and it's it's a byproduct of of not being forced to utilize it in problem solving and in you know when when helicopter parents are right there to make sure that you know their kids life looks like they want it to look like I mean there's a there's a lot of reasons you could point back to in my opinion that would that would explain the 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 lack of common sense approach in society today but that you know when you and I spoke last week we talked about you, you made a very impassioned statement about getting off the bench and, and getting into the game that we are, we are in the fight and, and, and that Patriots need to get in the fight. And, and that resonated with me in a way as, as you look at New Jersey and the mail-in voting fraud that's happening up there. And, and the reason I ask you in the first, the first question about the agenda is I'm not a, I'm not a smart man, but, but I, I seem to see, and I think a correlation between 
the mail-in voting narrative and coronavirus. And and I'm curious to get your take on, on whether or not that's being utilized as a tactic or weapon in trying to push that agenda across clearly to increase fr- fraudulent voting practices or at least create the opportunity for it. Well, as the Socialist Democrats are renowned for, they never let a crisis go to waste, and they try to manipulate a crisis to their political advantage. They're doing that now on a number of fronts. Mail-in voting is ripe for fraud. It doesn't have any of the safeguards that you have when you vote in person at a voting booth, nor does it have the safeguards associated with absentee balloting. And you've already got in New Jersey Democrat elected officials and volunteers having been arrested for voter fraud associated with mail-in uh, voting. Very easy to steal elections with mail-in voting. So if you respect your republic, if you love your republic, you should be opposed to mail-in voting because of the risk that, yeah, you'll get to vote, but it doesn't make any difference because someone's stolen the election. No, that's exactly right. And, and and you know, Texas is going through something right now with, with their, their – their, they rescinded the ability for bars and, and restaurants and such to operate, but, but yet they held huge parade this weekend, um, celebration of uh, – you know, just uh, it was a LGBT, LMNOP parade, and and I just there's some, I don't know, there's some hypocrisy, there's a lack of consistency in it that I have a hard time wrapping my mind around. And as Alabama comes up to, like I said, Governor Ivy potentially extending her order, where where would you? Uh, Kind of help me understand your, your your thought process on as states are opening and reopening and then reacting to a spike in. I mean, how should we approach this? The key litmus test is whether we have enough hospital beds to take care of those who get COVID-19. If we have enough hospital beds, if we can offer people the best treatment that is available, then we have done what we need to do. Now, if we run short of hospital beds and the healthcare profession is swamped and people aren't getting the health care that is needed to increase survival rates, then we have to do what is necessary to slow down the rate of contagion. Well said, Congressman. Well said. That's uh, and that's what I, you know, and that's what that's what needs to be said is a like I said, a common sense approach to to the virus and to our reaction to it. Congressman, on our way out, I, I want to give you the last word. Uh, you, you always have great uh, great statements to make and, and great calls to action. So I want to give you the last word here, uh, and you can take us out. Sure. Uh, America is under threat from political forces internally, unlike in the history of our country, with the possible exception of the Civil War. There are evil doctrines being advanced. There are dangerous positions being taken. And I urge all American patriots to exercise every power given them in the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights to protect the foundational principles that have combined to make America the greatest nation in world history. And these things are under attack, they're under threat, and it's hard to figure out what the right position is because you've got the fake news media basically being the communications wing for the Marxists and the socialists and the anarchists and what have you. So, America, do what you need to do, do your homework, be smart, vote accordingly. One more question. You, you brought up one more thought. Um, it, is, is President Trump in trouble in November? Well, all of us are at risk anytime there is an election. You never know what's going to happen next. And certainly President Trump comes under unceasing attack, uh, sometimes with true statements, sometimes with false statements. And that makes it that much more difficult for the American people to discern the truth and vote for what is in the best interest of America. So the Senate is at risk of going socialist or it's uh, hopefully will be retained by the good guys. The House may be re, uh, taken by the good guys, or it may continue to be socialist. And the White House is up for grabs. So the American people are going to have to do what is necessary to fight to preserve their republic if they want to keep their republic and the Bill of Rights that was given us way back in the 1700s. And it was not just given to us. I would say it was earned by those people who then gave it to us because they risked their lives in the Revolutionary War. That's spot on. That is spot on. Congressman, as always, it's been a pleasure talking with you this morning. We appreciate your time, and uh, we look forward to talking with you again soon. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, Congressman.